Welcome to our Tuesday live stream series, BP Oil Spill Survivors Tell Their Stories. The Alert Project is hosting Tuesday live streams from March 24th to April 21st. You can find past episodes posted on Alert's YouTube channel. I'm your host, Dr. Ricky Ott, the founder and director of the Alert Project. In episode one, we are joined by first responders and residents of Louisiana and a surprise guest, Dr. Ira Leifer. Dr. Leifer will share information about air monitoring over the Gulf of Mexico during the BP disaster in 2010. Cherie Kerner will share why her husband, Frank Stewart, is not here in person to share his own story as a first responder. Greg and Jamie Brown will share their stories from shrimpers to working the oil spill to survivors. The Alert Livestream series is designed to expose problems with our nation's outdated emergency response plan for oil disasters and to explore immediate solutions. I'm going to introduce Ira with a story. I am a survivor of the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill. I came down to the Gulf Coast on May 4th, 2010, intending to stay one month. Instead, I stayed through the first year memorial. During that time, I witnessed people in Gulf Coast communities across four states become sick with symptoms of exposure to oil and chemicals. In January, 2011, I realized that what I was witnessing was a preventable human health tragedy. The doctors weren't stepping up. Health officials weren't warning people. What we needed was a link to link the sicknesses of the oil chemical exposures. We needed real time air quality monitoring data. My telephone rang, it was Ira. He explained that he had done air monitoring over the BP oil disaster. He had analyzed the data and he was concerned that the high levels that he found up in the air were enough to cause human health harm. So Ira, Dr. Leifer, please share your story. All right, so to introduce myself, uh, my name's Ira Leifer, and I'm a researcher who used to be at the University of California in Santa Barbara at the time of the Deepwater Horizon. I now have my own company and do research independently. Uh, prior to the spill, I was a researcher in seepage, how oil and gas naturally come up from the seabed, and also someone who had looked at air quality and remote sensing of oil on the surface. So when Deepwater Horizon occurred, um, please show my first image of the seabed plume coming out of the cutoff riser, was one of the few people who had expertise both at the seabed and using remote sensing. Uh, as a result, I got tapped by NASA to lead the airborne remote sensing campaign to try to determine quantitatively how much oil was on the sea surface. The oil spill was vast. It covered tens of thousands of square miles at its greatest extent, way beyond what any airplane or what any observer on a boat could ever see. Satellites played a key role. I also was part of the plume team trying to figure out how much oil was coming up at the seabed, which was a time that I'll never forget of my life. Really a pressure cooker, not enough time, and everyone wanting to know how much oil was coming up. Uh, can you Hang on a second, Ira. Saskia, it's the second slide in the deck. That's the plume. Yes. That, uh, okay, now go so, on from there. This is at a mile deep, oil, gas coming up, hydrates are forming. You can see some of them. It's an air of expertise that's pretty uncommon except for seep researchers. The next slide shows, Saskia, the next slide shows just how extensive the oil spill was from satellite data. Yeah, covering vast areas of the Gulf. Uh, what we did with NASA is we managed to get a 
ER2, it flies in the stratosphere, almost in space. Next slide. Yes. No. Yes. So the ER2 can be seen in the upper right, Earth Research 2. It's a NASA airplane that flies in the stratosphere. And we used it to collect data that showed how much oil was on the sea surface and produced the first quantitative estimates of this in a few days, which confirmed that the amount of oil being released was way, way higher than had been officially acknowledged and was being reported at that time in the media. We use that data to convince NSF to give us some money and we got some boats, we being myself and Don Blake's team at UC Irvine to go offshore and collect air samples over the oil spill. These air samples showed high levels of concentrations of toxic gases like benzene, toluene, many others, at levels that are of great health concern. I shared this data with colleagues at NOAA, and they managed to divert one of their airplanes, which was doing uh, experiments and surveys in the Midwest to the Gulf to make measurements. So vicariously, we managed to get remote sensing information on the oil spill, as well as air quality information which showed that there could be significant health concerns for breathing the air. Uh, since then, I've done some work on modeling this at the amount of pollution emitted by the oil spill would cause problems for people on shore and looking at trying to look with various um, activists and doctors, try to help ensure that there is some uh, health provisions made for people who are suffering from that. Uh, this is a story that I think other people can tell better than I who are suffering from it. Uh, the techniques that we used you know, were not part of the response plan. So the goal we had was to try to develop those so they could be ready for the next oil spill. One of the big problems that was revealed was a lack of air measurements made during the spill. And for one of the things that I've done with my company since, uh, next slide please, is to develop a mobile air quality laboratory. Uh, next slide, Sheree. Thank you. Uh, in a Nissan Versa that can measure a wide range of gases while driving at up to the safest legal speed possible. Uh, this system, AMOG Surveyor, was developed uh, for satellite validation. So we could use the satellite data for many applications. Here you can see data we collected at the Cal Poly Research Dairy, looking at emissions from cows. Uh, next slide, please. We took the car and did a survey uh, in the area of uh, the Chino dairies in East Los Angeles. This is about 50,000 cows that are surrounded by urban sprawl. And here we see satellite data for the area showing ammonia is much higher over the dairy. Ammonia is a gas we can remote sense by satellite, but doesn't really have health effects. But we measure with my car, AMOG Surveyor, hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. Hydrogen sulfide does have significant health effects. Next slide. By fusing the two, we are able to make an exposure map of hydrogen sulfide, showing that hydrogen sulfide levels averaged over seven years. The satellites are always looking, they're always there, they're always observing, not <clears> just when I happen to be there with the car, and showed that levels in nearby dense communities were <clears> of, of a level that could be of significant concern with regards to health impacts from hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen impacts 
respiratory effects and does overlap with some of the type of effects that exposure to hydrocarbons from an oil spill involves. Uh, next slide. Uh, although the Nissan has been rebuilt as AMOC surveyor, which is more or less a hot rod, um, it is uh, very fun to drive. It weighs 2,000 pounds over stock. It's not good off road. So we reconfigured more recently our equipment into a package that can be put in a pickup truck. The next slide, please. And have been using this for looking at emissions from oil and gas, uh, specifically leak detection. Uh, we do work with commercial companies and with government agencies. And this is a, a type of technology that would be available in the future measurements and collect air samples where needed uh, in the event of an oil spill downwind. So to summarize, our goal has been to try to leverage the power of satellite to give it the functionality we can get by going where we need to go uh, with a package that could be put on a boat. So the, uh, as I call it, SIS, the Standard Instrumentation Suite. SIS is uh, designed to be sea spray proof and be able to go on a, a vessel or be placed into a field or driven around off-road with my pickup truck or another vehicle. And I think that gives an idea of the kind of tools that could be available in the next oil spill if they're in the oil spill plan extremely difficult to use a bring to bear new and latest technologies unless they've been stovepiped into the plans well in advance. Right now, of course, is the time that these technologies should be added to the plans. It's unclear how uh, effectively that is being accomplished by the bureaucracy. Okay, thank you, Ira. I have a, a couple of questions that was very informative. Um, what I was talking about and what I started to explain at the beginning is that we have a very outdated national contingency plan. And that plan is governs oil and chemical uh, responses, emergency responses. That is 26 years old. That is last century, okay? And what IRA is, it has developed and what is now available, uh, like the remote sensing that was done um, that Ira was part of, that's all technology that's in this century, okay? So what we really need here is we need to update the entire national contingency plan, not just the rules governing dispersant use. Um, so uh, what Ira is saying is this technology is available, it's usable, it will give us real time data that then the health officials, the doctors, the uh, people who are supposed to be monitoring our first responders um, can use to say, uh-oh, there's dangerous levels. We need to take preventative action and then take that preventative action. So we don't see um, this preventable human health tragedy that I'm just gonna call. Um, all right, there's a mouse that's gone crazy on the screen, so I hope that settles down. Um, and um, so the question I have, Ira, for you is, um, um, we had talked a little bit earlier um, about uh, other agencies that were out monitoring, and I think C Center for Disease Control, I'm sorry, took air quality monitoring data as well. Uh, and do you have any idea what they were using in uh, uh, what they found? Um, so there, there's a few things. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm getting suddenly an echo. Um, so I'm going to have to mute some. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm going to turn down the echo in my ear. Okay, um, in the la in the Deepwater Horizon spill, um, much of the more innovative response of the type we're discussing here 
was done by agencies which had NASA, for example, NOAA, not the oil spill response part. And so it was done catch as can, whereas other agencies, NOAA oil spill response, the Coast Guard and so on, have a mandate to respond, but only they are the ones who can officially do things. They have complete control of what's going on. Um, many of these technologies that we're talking about, though, such as the satellite remote sensing are public and available to everyone. And in general, uh, given a choice between uncertainty and doing nothing or certainty and taking firm and legally required action, often agencies will prefer uncertainty. And this leads to inaction, which is what was observed in the Deepwater Horizon. The CDC collected air samples on boats, analyzed them in the canisters, put the results into a report. But since the CDC is not a response organization for an oil spill, um, no action was taken based on their uh, data. The EPA is a response organization, but did not collect air samples on boats where response workers were. The EPA collected uh, air samples and data with a big van that seemed to generally be not where pollution problems were. Again, what's needed is both transparency and openness uh, data to be available to the public and made available in real time so that response actions that have to be taken and should be taken are taken based on data. Because if we count on actions and response to be taken uh, based on people doing the right thing, well, often they don't. Okay, thank you. So those data are available. The CDC has them, the CDC has reports, and the CDC is uh, available by subpoena if those records are needed, I would assume. Um, so um, I think um, that we're about, um, oh, I had one more question, and this is kind of a sadder one. Um, um, I am concerned uh, of what we're about to hear um, and what's going on right now. Um, what we're about to hear is from people who are sick and have respiratory problems and or whose immune system has been weakened by this, uh, these exposures 10 years ago. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions for people with uh, how might, with that, with the COVID pandemic that's going on right now, Ira? Uh, yes, so I have been following the uh, coronavirus epidemic pandemic through the literature, I, I generally find that a lot of misinformation is still being provided. Um, one can look to Italy to see our future and the trend has been proven out. Um, the healthcare system, wherever this happening is becoming overwhelmed and vaccines are far in the future. So the upshot is that your best defense, and by you I mean everyone listening, is your immune system. You can't count on the healthcare system to save your life. You have to take control of that and do the right things now. The right things? Very simple. Eat right. Sleep. Vitamin C. Zinc. Selenium. Various herbal um, um, mixtures. I find echinacea helps me not get the common cold. It's very important because uh, respiratory issues, which are a common comorbidity factor associated with the deep water horizon, may make the coronavirus much more risky for people who were uh, exposed during deep water horizon to oil spill and suffered health issues associated with that. In addition, uh, my recommendation that I've discussed with Ricky is that uh, as the healthcare system collapses, it's going to get bailed out by Congress. The a cost of treating all the patients is more than the hospitals or the health insurance industry 
can uh, deal with. We're already seeing that they're bailing airplanes and many other businesses. Obviously, the most important one will be to ensure that our health system actually remains financially solvent. When they do, it would be very uh, important to um, try to propose that language is put in that basically says, in addition to covering the cost of coronavirus treatment, any factors contributory, such as underlying respiratory issues, are also covered. This would then, without actually saying so, uh, encompass and provide health care for everyone who has had issues with BP's uh, spill, uh, the BP cough and the associated respiratory. So it's only a few words inserted into language in the legislation that will come down to try to keep our health system financially solvent and treat people could also finally achieve the goal that so many have been fighting for for decades now since the spill or a dec and unsuccessfully. Okay, thank you, like Lyra. Decades. I know it's one. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And I'm uh, doubly concerned because both Ira and I um, are not medical doctors, but we didn't see the medical doctors stepping up during the BP disaster either. And what we're trying to say uh, together is that we need to take care of each other. And Ira was sharing some ways that he is taking care of himself. I personally am also doing a lot of uh, vitamins uh, right now, for example. But people who have their immune system whacked, who have their respiratory system whacked, who are fighting cancers are especially vulnerable um, for this. So um, right now we are going to um, switch to um, uh, um, another slide um, and we're gonna start the story of our, share the story of our first responders. And Saskia has been uh, problem solving to try to get our faces to appear on the screen as well, live, which they haven't been. So uh, anyway, uh, we're all coming to, we're all learning this together here. Um, so right now, um, before we start uh, Cherie's sto story with a video, I would like to go first to frame this story with a, uh, the slide um, of this one, uh, whoop, Grand Isle to Venice, these this is what you're going to be hearing about. That's the exact slide. Um, Grand Isle to Venice, Louisiana. You will hear from both uh, Cherie about her husband, Frank, and Greg. This is the area that he worked down on the coast. Grand Isle, Barataria Bay back there, and then down to Venice. So this is just to give everybody sort of a place um, as they um, see the video. So we're going to see a five minute video that Cherie kindly put together um, to frame our discussion, hopefully. So we're ready for the video. BP oil spill cleanup efforts for my dad, Frank Stewart. I created oil and water don't mix part two from the unused footage from part one. Part one was for a Loyola school film project, which featured the BP oil spill cleanup efforts for my dad, Frank Stewart and Mayor Timmy Kerner of Lafitte. Along with really good information about the oil spill cleanup, my dad also gave me a lot of really good dad jokes. My voice isn't in it. My voice is going to get completely edited out. Well, I want my voice edited out. No, that makes no sense. My name is Herschel Walker. No, it's not. It's I played not. football for Georgia. No, uh, introduce yourself and what you do, and then I'll get started. Okay. Uh, my name is Frank Stewart. I am the president of Stewart Consulting Group. We, um, during BP, uh, were one of the first responders down in the Lafitte area. 
down to Barataria and all the way down almost to Grand Isle. And we, uh, we made all of the provisions and all of the things necessary to get, get ourselves ready for when the oil would hit so that we would be able to respond. How did the oil spill impact your work life and your personal life? Well, when we first started down there, we were keeping fairly civilized hours. We were not working extended hours. We were probably working eight, nine hours a day. Once we heard the oil was coming, we pretty much went to 12 to 16 hour days. So uh, personal life and uh, life outside of uh, BP uh, for months uh, was non-existent. We were, we were pretty well. 24 7 almost eating drinking and sleeping bp oil spill did the oil spill help or hurt your company i think it was a great experience for the company it was a great experience for me personally i guess we had four people down there at, at one point and the other company that i was working with had, had a similar amount of people uh once we got going we brought that number down a little bit but um it, it had a good impact. I mean, it, it kept us all busy, but it kept us all really, really focused. This was not a job like you, you we normally do or, either, or any of us do. This was really a crusade to make sure that we protected the, the wetlands, that we protected the estuary, that we made sure that if there was a fisherman, a boat, or a crew member that, that needed work, we put them to work so they wouldn't lose their home, they wouldn't lose their car, they had a way to, to, to eat. Um, even down to the wives we utilized. If a wife wanted to work, uh, we had them preparing the meals to go out because every day we fed everybody at least three meals a day. Uh, we had to uh, be concerned with things like uh, heat. It was middle of summer when we were out there. So we had to tents erected during the, during the early days of the summer so that they could come in and get out of the heat for a while so when they ate their lunch they could get under the tent we had fans down there to keep them keep them from heating up while they were eating and, and to relax a little bit do you have any interesting or funny stories from the time we we never ran out of, of a sense of humor um and some of the things I guess that we found funny uh, were dangerous. Some of the things we find found funny, uh, it was either to laugh and worry about, oh my God. Um, you know, we had people fall overboard accidentally and you know, they fell over where it was perfectly safe and we would kid, kid them. We had people that fell over into the oil that wasn't so funny. Um, but almost every day we had something that, that happened that, that we could laugh at and enjoy. Do you have anything that you think? Well, to sum it up, I mean, they made a wise choice when they had me down there. It's a shame I couldn't have been every place because I know I could have done a great right. job. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> so we'll use that one for sure. Let's talk you up. What was going through your mind? What was going through my mind was um, wondering what if. What if we'd have gotten to the hospital immediately instead of five days later? What if they would have tested him for leukemia immediately instead of six weeks later? What if he'd have been able to get a bone marrow transplant from his own stored bone marrow immediately? Um, and the reason why that haunted me is because I had read in the um, Times-Picayune that British Petroleum 